Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, welcome to What Would She Read? St. Louis County Library's virtual program celebrating um, Women's History Month. It's also International Women's Day, so we're so glad that you can join us. Um, before we get started, just want to go over a few features of our Zoom environment, um, just so in case you're new here and want to know what's going on. Um, so tonight's program is in a webinar format, so your camera and microphone are not active. No one can see or hear you. Um, you can, although if you're having trouble hearing or seeing us, um, you might want to leave the program and then re-enter um, or to turn up the volume on your device. Um, we will have questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so you can answer your, you can put your questions into the chat box. That's that little icon that looks like a speech bubble with the word chat underneath it and uh, enter your questions there and we will answer them um, at the Q&A at the end. And we do have the closed captioning enabled and you can turn that on or off um, using the little captions icon in your icon bar. So tonight's presenters, um, I'm Sarah, I'm from Adult Services. Uh, I'm also joined by Robin from the training department. Um, Jasmine from Eureka Hills is unfortunately feeling under the weather and won't be able to join us this evening, um, but I will be covering her picks. And then we also have Alex from uh, the Mid County branch. Um, if you did sign up for this program before say one o'clock today, uh, you may have gotten an email that has a handout attached to it. That handout does have all of the books that we'll be talking about today as well as the name of the, the women that we'll be discussing today. Um, and uh, if you didn't get that, no worries. I'm, I'm going to be sending a follow-up email and I'll attach that uh, handout again. We're also recording this presentation and it'll be on our YouTube channel in um, a couple of days. So you'll get a follow-up email once the, the YouTube uh, link is ready. So um, yes, so how it's going to work is we're each going to have a woman from history uh, that we think made a really great contribution to history. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about her and we'll have one pick that um, relates to her, whether it's uh, about her or features her or is by her. And then uh, we'll have several picks, uh, contemporary picks that we think she would have liked if she were still alive today. So that's how it will work. All right. Um, all of our uh, titles are available at the library, um, either through our regular print catalog or through one of our e-media platforms like Hoopla or Overdrive slash the Libby, Libby app. Um, so yeah, so just click on the links in that handout and it'll take you right to our catalog so you can place a hold. So I'm going to be the one that goes ahead and uh, gets us started. So um, my historical woman is Katherine Johnson. Um, she is, uh, was an African-American mathematician who was pivotal in calculating the first flight paths into space and to land the first people on the moon. Um, she skyrocketed to fame in 2016 when she was in her late 90s uh, with the success of the collective biography Hidden Figures by uh, Margaret Lee Shutterly and the Oscar award-winning movie that was based on it. Um, that book and movie explore the um, work and lives of the quote-unquote West computers as the African-American women mathematicians at NASA were called. Um, back then, a computer was a job title, um, not a piece of technology, uh, and that job was primarily done by women. And at NASA, um, the computer labs, the computing labs were segregated by race. Um, after both reading the book and watching the movie, uh, I was inspired to find out more about Katherine Johnson and uh, was happy to see that she had written an autobiography as she neared her 100th birthday. Um, and the title of her autobiography, My Remarkable Journey, or, um, is like not a hyperbole. <laughs> um, so uh, from starting high school at age 10 to attending the Oscars at age 98, um, with an amazing amount of mathematical work and education uh, in between, her life was, was really was remarkable. So um, this book is written in a very personal and accessible style. It feels like she's right in the room with you, telling you her story. She emphasizes the importance of family um, education, especially as provided by Black educators, um, and strong convictions in her success. So if you want more of the story than you can find in Hidden Figures, like even if you read that book or watched that movie, um, definitely read My Remarkable Journey. She even sets the uh, the record straight on a few few scenes from the movie. So I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's not very long, but she packs it with with a ton a ton of interesting things about her life. 
Okay, so um, all of my picks uh, moving forward today celebrate women in STEM subjects, uh, so in uh, mathematics and science, uh, in the spirit of Johnson. So I think she would be especially proud of uh, Chandra Prescott Weinstein if Johnson had lived long enough to read The Disordered Cosmos, my, my first pick here. Um, this book is an accessible and engaging explanation of particle physics and quantum mechanics from a feminist and anti-racist perspective. Prescott Weinstein is one of less than 100 Black American women to earn a PhD from a physics department, and this has given her a unique perspective from which to question the language and models used in physics, um, and she asserts that they're built on, upon assumptions based on the experience and worldview of the white men that dominated the discipline for so long. Um, if this sounds like it might be a bit heavy, know that um, she weaves history, science, and pop culture references with her own personal story into a work that keeps you by turns fascinated, righteously outraged, and inspired. Um, she has a really distinctive voice that is direct and down to earth, um, as if you were at a coffee house or a bar, like passionately discussing your lives and work together. And her call to make sure that people of all ethnicities, races, genders, sexual orientations, classes, and abilities have full access to the wonders of science in the night sky will hopefully lead to better science and a more equitable society. And Katherine Johnson would certainly have agreed with that. Okay, so my next pick is The Calculating Stars. So there must have been something in the air during the 20 teens because uh, Kowal, um, uh, Mary Robinette Kowal wrote this um, alternate history science fiction book about women astronauts in an alternate 1950s America, um, actually just before Hidden, Pig Hidden Figures was published and the movie was released. So um, in The Calculating Stars, a meteorite hits Washington DC uh, in 1952 and wipes out much of the East Coast. Um, the new space exploration program is kicked into high gear, and all qualified people, regardless of gender, religion, and race, are called on to help reach the goal of creating a Mars colony to save humanity from future meteor destruction. Um, the main character of the novel, Elma York, works for NASA as a computer um, and uh, her husband as an engineer, and um, they are on vacation in the Poconos when the meteor hits, and they become integral to the new accelerated space program. And although uh, Elma faces discrimination as a woman and as a Jew, she fights for herself and all women, regardless of race, to apply to become astronauts. Um, Kowal did quite a bit of research to uh, both make sure her alternate timeline was believable uh, and to reflect the experience of historical women in the military and space programs in the 1950s. And she notes that several characters in the book are based around real women that you can read about in Hidden Figures, as well as in Rise of the Rocket Girls by Natalia Holt. Um, this is a really fun and inspiring reading, a read that will please both historical fiction and science fiction fans. And I think Katherine Johnson would have loved to see herself and the other West computers reflected in this book um, and even becoming astronauts themselves. Okay, so my next pick is The Tenth Muse by Catherine Chung. Um, this historical fiction novel centers on Catherine, uh, with a K, um, a mathematician with a Chinese immigrant mother and a white World War II veteran father. She's one of only of the only, she's one of the only female graduate students at MIT uh, in the 1960s, and her goal is to solve the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, a longstanding mathematical mystery. Um, her mother had left the family when she was a teen, um, and Catherine grew somewhat distant from her father when he remarried. So she has many questions about herself and her identity, and, um, as, and she has as many of those as she has about the universe. Um, when she discovers a secret about her parents, she goes to Germany, um, post-war Germany, to uncover the truth. And the theorem that she studies may hold the key to unlocking it. Um, Chung, the author Chung um, herself was like a student and lover of mathematics, and she weaves mathematical theory and historical figures like real, real um, uh, mathematicians from the time into the novel. So fans of mid-century STEM history will enjoy the realistic world building, as will anyone who likes uh, World War II and post-war historical fiction with strong female characters. 
Um, Catherine Johnson would recognize the barriers that the main character in this novel, Catherine, faces as a woman of color in the 1960s um, and the things that one often has to sacrifice for success, um, even if the particular details of their lives were quite different. Okay, so um, next I have Transcendent Kingdom by Yaya Si. Um, this novel is, uh, is contemporary. Um, it centers on Gifty, a second generation Ghanaian American and the only member of her immediate family to be born in the US. She is a PhD candidate in neuroscience at Stanford and she studies reward seeking behavior in mice in order to gain insight into human addiction and depression. And this topic is very close to her heart because her brother died of a drug overdose when he became addicted to Oxycontin after a sports injury, and her mother suffers from very deep depression. Um, <clears throat> so Gifty grapples with um, the sometimes competing prom promises of salvation uh, from, uh, that, from these issues that are offered by science as well as the evangelical faith of her childhood. So she has this sort of um, internal... Uh, tension between faith, faith and science. Um, the book has really realistically drawn characters that give you insight into the complex pressures of being both um, an immigrant and black in America um, generally, and also specifically in academia. Uh, Gifty's story, um, comparing Gifty's story with Katherine Johnson's, you can see how uh, important a supportive family and educational environment like Johnson had are in achieving success. Um, this book was on many 2020 best of the year lists, but given like what was going on in the world at the time, it's possible that some readers may have missed it. So if you did, uh, definitely, definitely check it out. Okay, and then my final pick is In, in the Field by Rachel Pastan. Um, this historical fiction novel is loosely based on the life of Nobel Prize winning geneticist Barbara McClintock. Uh, the main character of the novel, though, is named Kate Croft, and she defies social pressure uh, of the 1920s to, um, she defies the social pressure to marry early and convinces her mother to let her attend college at Cornell University. Um, she's the only woman working in the botany lab, and uh, though her strong work earns her some grudging acceptance and uh, even one lifelong friend, um, many of the men in the department uh, steal her discoveries, downplay her contributions, and like kind of ostracize her. Um, Kate does find some happiness, but also frustration in the friendships and love affairs she develops with other women. Um, she realizes, though, that her deep research into plant genetics and her drive to, to work and to like solve these genetic mysteries that um, she uncovers um, will often be incomprehensible to those that she loves and cause conflicts in her personal life. Um, we the book follows Kate over a number of years, and uh, it shows like really what it took for women to reach the highest levels of scientific achievement in the mid 20th century, and how much um, work it takes to be true to the subjects and the people that you love. Um, Catherine Johnson, too, understood this tension between family, uh, life, and work, and although we have come a long way, uh, many contemporary readers, I'm sure, will also relate to some of these issues. Um, this is another great read for those that enjoy mid-century historical fiction with women characters that persevere uh, in reaching their dreams. All right, so next up we have Robin, so go ahead and take it away, Robin. Hello, everybody. I'm Robin. I am the trainer, the lab trainer at um, Fluorescent Valley Branch, and the woman I'm going to talk about today is Nellie Bly. So um, I'd like to start by saying that I really didn't know much about Nellie Bly. Um, I remembered her vaguely from elementary school and other kids' book reports, but she wasn't somebody I paid a lot of attention to. Um, what I did love was the idea of early travel. So for me, um, all the vacations and um, moves that I made in my life were huge adventures and always something that was a lot of fun, but they also had an element of frustration and um, things that you would, could do a little different no matter how much you planned. So I like to think about early travel, um, what it took to travel around the world um, and what kind of adventures and extra danger and excitement there might've been. So I also really liked the book 
around the world in 80 days when I was little. And that's what made me pick up this book. Um, this book is 80 Days by Matthew Goodman. And it is a book about Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bislin racing to make it around the world in less than 80 days um, and also to beat the other one. So this book starts with a lot of background about the two women, and I was amazed by all of the things that I did not know about Nellie Bly and all of the adventures that she had actually taken part in. Um, I'd heard of her first big story where she was admitted to Blackwell's Island, Blackwell in, Island's Insane Asylum, and that she had reported on the mistreatments of all the patients there and how it caused all these reforms that happened afterwards. So I kind of had that in my mind, but I didn't know that she had also worked in a paper box factory, um, that she had trained with a boxing champion, that she interviewed Helen Keller, or that she performed as a chorus girl, all these things just to get a story. Um, so she had the idea about traveling around the world in less than 80 days and she brought it to her publisher at this point the book um, by Jules Verne around the world in 80 days was published 16 years previously and she wanted to do it in 75 days so her editor said no not at this time but she was so passionate about the idea that she made him promise that if the paper ever did do it and they wanted to send a reporter, that reporter would be her. So he agreed. And about a year after that, he called her into his office and said, can you start around the world after, a day after tomorrow? And she replied, I can start this minute. And that's what I loved about this book. I loved that attitude, that willingness to dive right into the next adventure. And more of more and more of this book that I read, the more I felt that spirit. The book is actually about two women, not just Nellie Bly, um, but also about Elizabeth Bislin. And it's interesting to see the similarities and the differences between these two women and how they are talked about and how they were approached about this grand adventure. Um, and how they each took on the challenge of trying to make it around the world in 1889, which was before the first successful self-propelled flight in 1903. So that's what I really enjoyed about that book and made me want to see what else I could find out about that time. So the next book is um, The Truth from Terry Pratchett. So Terry Pratchett is my favorite author or one of my favorite authors, and he is best known for his Dis Discworld series. And that series follows the development of and growth of a city on a different world and all the people within that city. So early on in this book series, there's a book called The Truth. And this is when the printing press first comes into use in the main city of the book. And it's also when the first newspaper comes into that city. And there's a whole underlining theme about what truth is and what journalism is throughout. And one of the side characters is named Sacharissa. Her father loses work due to the printing press, and she starts working at the printing at the new newspaper in town just to kind of have a job. Um, and in the beginning of this book, when she shows up, she's kind of timid and shy and uncertain. But as the series progresses, she starts to grow into herself and into her position as one of the main journalists in this entire world almost. Um, and she starts to be so well known that even the most powerful people in the city get nervous when she stops by to do an interview. Um, I think seeing the development of journalism in a fictional world and seeing the development of this character might be something that would convince Nellie, Nellie Bly to give this book a try. So my next book is Listen World, and this one is by Julia Shears. So I had never heard about this woman, um, but I loved the title, like just underneath that Listen World, it says how the intrepid Ellie Robinson became America's most read woman. And that kind of threw me, like how could somebody who is the most read person woman be somebody I never even heard of? Um, so I, oh, I thought it was neat because um, when I was reading about it, it described the main character as having moxie. And I thought that this was a word that was probably used to describe Nellie Bly more than once. Um, it's also nonfiction, which I enjoy. So I ended up loving this book. Um, this person lived such an interesting life. At one point, she was nationally syndicated. Um, she had millions of readers. She worked for two major newspapers. And um, she even had clubs of kids who would celebrate her books and like dress up and do all kinds of stuff, parades and everything. Um, but most of the book talks about her life before she became famous. Um, she grew up poor in a frontier town, sort of, in California. And um, she ended up marrying a wealthy New Englander and moving to Vermont. And she was 
absolutely miserable there. And she used reading and writing as a kind of way to escape and to find a bit of freedom in the life she had made for herself. Um, she also had a child and started writing short stories for him as well. Um, so eventually she ends up going without her husband um, to California, again, um, for her child who had some ill health. And when she goes west, um, she goes with this gentleman who later leads for her to end up getting a divorce. And this was extremely shocking back in the 1900s. Um, and there's all these newspaper articles um, that she submitted talking about her side of the story to try to avoid some of the scandal and to try to get custody of her son. Um, so she ended up needing to support herself and her son. Um, so she actually started mining, which again, this is the early 1900s. So just knowing that she was a miner and that she was trying all these different things is interesting to me. Um, and eventually the mining dries up and they move to the city and they start running out of money and she has to find another way to support herself. So just like she does in lots of times of trials for her, she turns to her writing and that's when everything starts picking up for her and she ends up getting her columns and ended up getting syndicated. And I think her willingness to throw herself into new adventures that weren't entirely acceptable for women in her times and her love of writing would have interested Nellie Bly. And the book briefly mentions Nellie Bly as in her work as somebody who kind of paved the way for her. So I thought that was kind of interesting to see too. Um, the next book that I want to talk about is Sensational, The Hidden History of America's Girl Stunt Reporters by Kim Todd. So this book was interesting to me, mainly just because it talked about what this was. Like I said, I didn't know much about it before I started um, working, reading books for this one, um, for this program. And it was interesting to hear about all the different stunt reporters that they kind of categorize. It talks about the rise and the fall of the girl stunt reporters too. And the book talks about several different reporters. So it's not just one of them. And it made it feel like something that every paper in that time was trying to do. And it made it feel like it was a big rise of an error and not just an isolated thing where just one or two people were doing it. Um, it also impressed me the lengths that the women um, in these stories were willing to go to to get the story. They put themselves in real danger um, to get to the truth. And just the way they kept going and trying all these things that they had never done before to get the story and get the truth. Um, I think that Nellie Bly would have enjoyed it because it felt like the book placed her as one of the main forces for creating this whole movement. Um, and I also thought it was interesting because the success of the Blackwell Island Insane Asylum um, reporting seemed to have created the hunger for more and more of this type of journalism. And this book also talks about the rise and the fall of it. So it was interesting to see about some of what they said came next as well. Um, all right, so the next book is Mad Woman by Louisa Traeger. And this book um, is a fictionalized version of Nellie's stay in um, Blackwell Island. I wouldn't have normally picked this book up. This is um, a book that was a little hard to read at parts just because of what it was about. Um, there are parts that describe some of the treatment that the patients and Nellie went through and experienced. And for me, when it's a fictional book, you can hear the main character's thoughts and feelings. It makes it feel a little bit more close um, to your heart. So it's a little harder to get through some of the bad situations. And there are times in the story where she loses hope about ever getting out. Um, so I picked this book up mainly because um, this was a huge story for Nellie Bly. This is what made her kind of become famous and gave her the opportunity to do all those other things that she got to do later on. And it's what I knew most about her before I had read the book about her great race around the world. Um, and it's also a new book. It was written just last August. And I thought the fact that there was a fictionalized version of one of her stories more than 100 years later um, would be enough to make her give it a try. All right. So my final book is White Collar Girl by Renee Rosen. And this book is about a woman in the 50s, and she is trying to make it as a serious reporter. Um, when the book starts out, the main character is checking the spelling of names for fancy and exclusive weddings and writing recipes and writing about charity balls and celebrity sightings. 
this isn't what she wants to do. And she wants to try to prove herself to everyone, her parents and her coworkers and so on. And of course, she has all the obstacles she's got to go against and fight through to get that opportunity. So this book follows her journey as she tries to have a career and make a name for herself. And she deals with some of, of course, the complications, um, especially from 1950s. And I picked it up because I thought it went along with the themes of women breaking into journalism and that Nellie Bly might relate to some of the things that um, she goes through. I think it was neat that through the book, um, though the book is fictional, the scandals that they talk about were scandals that really took place during that time. Um, so it was kind of neat to see how they reported it and how they were talked about in the, in the news offices. And I think that also might have interested Nellie Bly. So I don't know if she would have liked this book or not. It wasn't one of my favorite, but I did enjoy it. Um, I picked it up thinking it was going to be all about making it big as a reporter. And it definitely had some of that. Um, but it was really a book about family and finding a way to connect to her family and healing after a family tragedy um, that impacted just about every aspect of this woman's life. Um, and I think that the story uses her career as a reporter to help her make those connections. So I think she might have read this book um, thinking that she could relate to the character. And as I was reading it, I was picturing Nellie Bly reading it and maybe rolling her eyes at some part or nodding her head in agreement. And I bet there would have been enough to keep her reading just like there was enough to keep me reading. So those were my picks. And thank you for joining me. Here is Jasmine. Well, actually, here is Sarah again. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Robin. Uh, yes, for those of you who joined a bit late, unfortunately, Jasmine is feeling under the weather, but I'm going to cover her books for you. So you'll still hear about um, Julia de Burgos, um, as well as all of Jasmine's picks. Um, I did have some of Jasmine's notes to go on as well as um, like I'll fill out some of it with some professional reviews. So uh, so we'll talk about her books um, and we, we all wish uh, Jasmine well. So Okay, so um, Julia de Burgos was a Puerto Rican poet whose body of work paved the way for the feminist, social justice, and Afro-Latino cultural empowerment uh, movements within the island of Puerto Rico um, and the New York movement in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, our library system doesn't have like a full biography on de Borgos, um, but there is a short story in this book, uh, The Heart of American Poetry by Edward Hirsch, where the author recalls the time he introduced de Borgos to Federica Garcia Lorca, um, a, fa a famous Spanish poet and playwright. Um, it gives some brief biographical information about de Borgos. Um, so Julia Constanza Burgos Garcia uh, was born in Santa Cruz, Carolina, Puerto Rico. Uh, she was of Afro-Latina background, although uh, many of her pictures and background information is often a little whitewashed. Um, but de Burgos never denied her African ancestry. Um, in fact, she used her poetry to put the plight of Afro-Latinos on the island uh, in the forefront. While her poetry gave her entrance into the Puerto Rican social elite, her family, her background, um, and the fact that she was divorced meant that she didn't fit into the conservative Catholic society of 1930s Puerto Rico. Um, after divorcing her second husband, she chose to add the day before Burgos, uh, which in Spanish indicates marital status um, or possession. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Julia de Burgos had reclaimed herself uh, in a symbolic act of feminist defiance. Okay, so uh, the first pick that Jasmine thinks that um, uh, de Borgos would like to read is How to Hide an Empire by Daniel Imerwar. Um, this uh, nonfiction book, How to Hide an Empire, a, greater, a History of the Greater United States, posits that the United States imperial possessions, including the past occupation of the Philippines and the current territorial ownership of Puerto Rico, uh, Guam, etc., um, has contributed greatly to the trajectory and overall growth and prosperity of this country. Um, he states, quote, my point here is not to weigh forms of oppression against one another. In fact, the histories of African Americans and colonizer people are tightly connected and sometimes overlapping. As for um, the Afro-Caribbeans in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, the racism that had pervaded the country since slavery engulfed the territories too, end quote. So um, the persecution and suffering of the people of these territories inhabited um, by not mostly non-white people is a plight that de Borgos uh, directly suffered since she came from the island of Puerto Rico. And chapter seven of this book uh, really focuses on Puerto Rico, beginning with the story of Pedro Al um, Albizu Campos, the prominent lawyer and politician who was an important figure in the movement to liberate Puerto Rico. 
Um, de Burgos was general secretary of the Frente Unido Femenino, uh, the Women's United Front, and she delivered speeches and wrote letters advocating for the release of Campos um, after he was imprisoned for sedition charges by the U.S. government. So it would have been um, of great interest to her to see what became of him and his movement, um, which she could read about in this book. And so can you. <laughs> Okay, the next book is The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. So this is a young adult novel that's written in verse. It's like in poetic form um, about the experience of a Catholic teen Dominican American poet in New York. Um, but it does have a lot of crossover adult appeal and it certainly would have resonated with de Burgos. Um, the Publishers Weekly Review says that this um, says this about the book, quote, Harlem sophomore Ciamara Batista isn't saintly like her virtuous twin brother. And her tough exterior, she's always ready to fend off unwelcome advances and unkind words, hides questions and insecurities. As her confirmation nears after two failed attempts, Siomara begins to voice her uncertainties about her Catholic faith and the patriarchal piety pressed on her by her mother and the church. Both intrigued and disgusted by the advances of her peers and older men, she begins a secret relationship with her lab partner, Aman, who seems interested in more than her curves. Siomara pours, uh, pours her innermost self into her poems and dreams of competing in poetry slams, a passion she's sure that her conservative Dominican parents would never accept. Debut, debut novelist Acevedo's free verse gives Siomara's coming of age story an undeniable pull, its emotionally charged bluntness reflecting her determination and her strength. At its heart, this is a complex and sometimes painful exploration of love in its many forms, with Siomara's growing love for herself reigning supreme. So, end quote. So uh, check it out if you want a great novel about a contemporary young poet sort of in the spirit of de Burgos. Okay, the next pick is When Trying to Return Home by Jennifer Maritza McCauley. Um, this is a short story collection written from the perspectives of Black, American, and Afro-Latino characters from the United States and Puerto Rico. Um, it delves into questions of belonging. Um, these are the voices of people who have always been here but have been relatively pushed to the sidelines, neglected, and abused. The second short story shares the novel's title, um, and it is about a Black Puerto Rican woman and her migration from the island um, to what Puerto Ricans refer to as, quote, the mainland, um, aka the greater United States. Uh, the main character, like all of the other characters in the book, has to struggle with prejudices that still exist within their cultures as well as those outside of their respective communities. This plight was an issue that de Burgos examined and wrote about in many of her poems, um, particularly in her two most famous um, poems, uh, colorism, racism, um, colorism and racism within the Latino and Hispanic communities existed during de Burgos' time and is sadly still rampant today. So I'm gonna read two uh, quick quotes from these two famous poems um, that sort of speak to the themes that are in this book. Um, so from the poem, Ay, 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 De La Grifa Negra. Ay, 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 my black, my black race flees, and with the white runs to become bronzed, to be one for the future fraternity of America. And then from the poem, Rio Grande de Loisa. Rio Grande de Loisa, great river, great flood of tears, the greatest of all our island's tears, save those greater that come from the eyes of my soul for my enslaved people. So yeah, so these themes are um, show up in this book and uh, Jasmine highly recommends this one. Okay, next pick is Notes on Grief by Chimamande Ngozi Adichie. Um, if Julia de Borgos were alive today, Jasmine believes she would read and be an ardent admirer um, of Adichie. Uh, Adichie is a first-generation Nigerian-American author, a feminist, a successful writer who has won numerous awards and recognitions. In fact, Adichie has had 16 honorary doctorate degrees awarded to her. And a successful Black female literary figure was the dream that de Burgos desired, and so Jasmine believes she would have been happy to see a woman today achieve such prominence. Um, Notes on Grief is a short and very specific book. It's a memoir about the death of Chimamanda's father, James Nwoye Adichie, um, and in the book she describes all of the emotions she and her family felt after losing such a beloved paternal figure. Um, yeah, 
De Borgos lost six of her 12 siblings in Puerto Rico and suffered from depression in her later years. So she may have found solace in some of the things in uh, um, this, this memoir. Um, there is a passage that a friend quoted to Adichie from one of her works after her father's passing. And uh, this line sounds very similar to one of De Borgos' poems. And uh, the quote is, quote, grief was the celebration of love. Those who could feel real grief were lucky to have loved. So um, if you like both Adichie and De Borgos um, have dealt with grief in your life, this would be a really great pick to, um, to explore that. Okay, and then her last pick is White Tears, Brown Scars, How White Feminism Betrays Women of Color by Ruby uh, Hamad. Um, this is a non-fiction uh, non exploration of feminism from an anti-racist perspective um, that covers topics really close to Julia, uh, Julia de Borgos's heart. Um, the Library Journal's review of the book states, quote, journalist Hamad's debut focuses on racism within feminist movements, providing historical context for how feminism and racism have developed over time. Um, the author argues that white feminists often reinforce racism by victimizing themselves in conflicts with people of color and seeking to maintain and advance their own privileges. Um, much of the book explores the history of colonialism, which uh, de Burgos does as well, um, and in the ways in which white women actively oops, um, actively participated in the oppression of people of color. Um, the author offers commentary on modern events that show how patterns in white women's harmful behavior towards women of color continues today. Um, just a few of the many topics included uh, co uh, covered include uh, Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, sexualizations of the era of slavery, the history of, ang of the you know, angry black woman stereotype, and illustrative incidents in pop culture. Um, and the verdict from um, uh, from the review is, despite covering a great deal of content, the message and intent behind the text remain clear. Readers engaged with issues of race and feminism in Western countries will find this a powerful read. So if you want to learn more about the issues at the center of de Burgos' poetry and activism, um, these are issues that are like really um, kind of at the heart of what feminism is today, then definitely check this one out. All right. So next up, we have Alex. Take it away, Alex. Hello. So um, for my pick, I chose to focus on Ida B. Wells, who was a journalist, an early uh, leader in civil rights activism, and a suffragist. She helped to found numerous organizations, um, including the National, National Association of Colored Women's Club and was one of the co-founders of the NAACP. Um, some of the things that uh, Wells was most passionate about focusing on um, were uh, suffered, um, women's suffrage and then also um, anti-lynching. So, Wells, um, after uh, fr uh, motivated by the murder of one of her friends uh, at the hands of a white mob, um, uh, Wells dedicated a lot of time to researching incidents of lynching, including risking her life by going into the South to investigate um, accounts of it. And she then published those uh, and traveled internationally to talk to other countries about lynching in the United States. She was also a very vocal advocate for women's suffrage. She saw it as a way for Black women to become politically active and help to elect African Americans to positions of power. Pardon me. That said, she was incredibly critical of the larger suffrage movement in the United States um, for its um, leaving out of women of color to try to placate Southern suffragists, as well as um, racist, racist views held by members of the cause as a whole and their ignoring of lynchings in the South. The book I chose today um, is called Ida B. the Queen and Extra the Extraordinary Life of Ida B. Wells. It is written by Michelle Duster, who is Wells's great-granddaughter. The book itself is less 
then it's not exactly what you would think of when you think of a biography. It focuses a great deal more on Wells's legacy and the impact that she had on the greater fight for racial equity in America that's still going on today. Uh, Duster also takes a great deal of time talking about how being Wells's great granddaughter has impacted her as an individual. And there is also a significant portion of the book that is dedicated to talking about how Wells's family have fought to help memorialize her legacy, including Wells's daughter editing um, Wells's autobiography, as well as donating some of Wells's writings to the University of Chicago, which was Ada B. Wells's alma mater. And also how uh, Ida B. Wells's grandsons formed the Ida B. Wells Memorial Foundation. But I think that it's a really great book. Um, it takes a lot of uh, images of newspaper clippings that Wells was featured in, or also um, clippings and photos of uh, contacts that she had with people. So I think that it's a really good read to not only learn about Ida B. Wells, but learn about her legacy and um, how her family has really fought to um, promote that legacy. So for my first, What Would She Read? I picked the book Against White Feminism, Notes on Disruption by Rafia Zakaria. So um, much like White Tears, uh, brown scars, this book discussed how Western feminism is not and has never been designed for everybody. It is for white upper middle class women and girls. And in this book, Zakaria uses research and historical analysis to discuss how historically feminism has been used as a guise for white women to perpetuate their sociopolitical domination over black and brown women. Um, it also provides uh, an argument for how the failures and flaws of white feminism can't be addressed by simply adding diverse voices to the existing structure. Um, uh, Zakaria really argues that the system of feminism as it exists today needs to be dismantled and rebuilt. This is something that would have very much resonated with Ida B. Wells, given her um, very vocal criticism of how the women's suffrage movement did not care about and did not try to um, include and protect women of color. So I think that this is one that would um, really have resonated with her. The next one is a collection of poems actually called Felon. It is by Reginald Dwayne Betts. And these poems examine the effects that incarceration has on a human um, even after that person um, has re-entered um, society. And uh, Betts himself is a formerly incarcerated individual who started writing poetry while he was incarcerated. And it uses a variety of poetry styles, but um, personally, I thought the one that was the ones that were the most moving were the ones that were uh, blackout poetry that was made by redacting um, words from court documents. Um, typically redacting is used to hide top secret information, but in this, Betts uses it as a way to um, highlight some of the failings of the criminal justice system. And the point of the book as a whole is to really just illustrate what it means to be a felon in American society. Um, I think that the issue of incarceration of people of color would be something that would uh, that Wells would care very deeply about. And I think that it would be important for her to hear somebody somebody's voice on the experience of incarceration and um, would be very interested in reading uh, these poems. The third book that I chose 
is The Deep by River Solomon. Um, you will see that this has additional authors credited to it. That is because the inspiration for this story was a song by the rap group Clipping. And so Solomon gave them author credits on the book as well. So The Deep tells the story of the Wajin Ru, which are uh, water-breathing merfolks who are the descendants of the pregnant women who were thrown off of slave ships. And in this society, only one member of the society holds on to the collective memories of the Wajin Ru because they are considered um, mostly too painful to have to relive on a daily basis. And our main character, Yetu, is the historian in her society and is very much struggling with being the only person who is having to remember these very traumatic things in the Wajin Ru's history. However, every year there is a great remembrance where Yetu gives those memories to all of the Wajin Ru for them to experience themselves. And during this, Yetu runs away from the society, leaving the, um, the rest of her people to suffer through these memories with no guidance. Um, this book deals really heavily with the themes of memory, identity, and cultural trauma. And I think that this would be something that Wells would read, not only because um, it's important to understand your people's history and cultural trauma is very much something that exists within the Black community, but also uh, Wells herself was born into slavery. So I think that she would care very deeply about a book that is focused on people who are the descendants of people who were thrown off of slave ships. The fourth book that I picked is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. And this book is our main character's name, Star, or our named main character is Star. And she is a young Black girl who lives in a predominantly Black area, but attends a private school that is predominantly white. The inciting incident of this book is um, Star witnesses her friend Khalil be shot and killed by a white police officer when um, Khalil is unarmed. And the book kind of deals with the fallout of Star struggling to come to terms with what happened as well as whether or not to use her voice to try to advocate for who Khalil was and the incidents of the incidents that led to him being shot and killed by the police officer, as opposed to letting um, the officer run the narrative himself. It also deals with Star trying to split her personality in two, um, particularly with her white friends. So as out of fear of being portrayed as an angry black woman, Ada B. Wells would probably be uh, a lot of people's prototype for the angry Black woman trope. And I think that um, not only would Wells really care about Star finding the way to embrace her Blackness and that portion of her personality, but I also believe that Wells would be somebody who would be a very vocal um, uh, member of the Black Lives Matter movement and um, just dealing with issues of um, uh, unarmed Black people being shot and killed. Uh, and then my final book that I picked is How Long Till Black Future Month by N.K. Jemison. This is a collection of short stories that are all um, in the Afrofuturism genre. So Afrofuturism is a type of science fiction that um, incorporates elements of Black history and Black culture. And within this book, there are uh, several different subgenres that are explored. So in the short story, 
the effluent engine um, that is an alternate history story. Um, another one on the banks of the river Lex is a post-apocalyptic story. And then the Trojan girl is a cyberpunk story. Um, and while these short stories do all exist um, in their own worlds, they do have some overarching themes through them, including um, dystopian worlds and um, themes of power, resistance, and agency. And then another similarity that you see in a lot of the uh, stories in this book is that the protagonists are not members of the dominant cultures in the societies in which they live. This is one that I think Wells would like because one, I think she would very much want to support um, an author uh, who is a woman of color that is writing in a white male dominated genre. Um, I think it would be very important to her to uh, support um, this woman's work and what she is, you know, her artistry. Uh, I also think that um, stories where, you know, it's about resistance and where your protagonist isn't the member of the dominant culture would really speak to her. So those are the books I have chosen that I think Ida B. Wells would read. And to wrap us up, I'm going to send it back to Sarah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alex and um, and and Robin as well. Um, yeah, we have a lot of really great picks. Uh, I so I have to say, um, uh, how long till Black Future Month is just like one of my favorite titles of all time. It's just such a clever title and just I don't know it says so much. It's like so evocative. Um, and I have read the deep. But we can talk about that at the Q and A. But um, anyway, uh, before we get to the Q and A, I just want to remind you that um, our chat box is open. So if you have any questions for us, feel free to put those in the chat, and we'll answer them in just a minute. Um, and you got a lot of great uh, suggestions tonight, but if you would like more reading suggestions, uh, please try out our personalized reading service. This is a form you can find on our website <clears throat> under the books, e-media and more tab. Fill it out with the things you like and you don't like, and you'll re receive a list of five titles that we've created just for you. Um, we also have some other really great adult virtual programs coming up. We have we have a lot of programs for readers this spring. Uh, next week uh, on Thursday, March 16th, uh, we have If You Love Neil Gaiman. This is another staff picks kind of uh, program, but it is celebrating Neil Gaiman, who is the winner of this year's St. Louis Literary Award. Uh, so each of our presenters will be picking um, a Neil Gaiman work that we that we like, and then some read-alikes for that book. So uh, that'll be a fun one, especially if you like fantasy. And then uh, in April, I, um, I'm doing a program called Spring Into Reading, where I'm going to share some tips for breaking your reader's block, getting back into a love of reading, uh, as well as uh, some library resources for finding new things, and a couple of under-the-radar titles uh, that you might have missed that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, you can find out about those and more events on our events page. And then, yeah, let's uh, have some questions. I'm going to um, stop sharing my slides and put us back into gallery view. So if you have any questions, do please put those into the chat box. Okay. All right. And Alex and Robin, if you'd like to turn your cameras back on and um, Harry too, do we have any questions, Harry? Not yet, but I have questions for you because I watched the presentation. So I want to ask all of you, you each had six picks. Which one of your picks would you tell readers to pick first? Hmm. Well, I will answer that for me. It was Listen World. I really enjoyed the book and I did not expect to. Um, she really, Elsie had an amazing life and she did so many things that I did not know about. And it just blows my mind that I had never heard of her at all. And she was one of the most popular writers in her time for newspapers. So it, I would definitely recommend that. It's also really easy to read and really well written. So you can read it and not have to like pay too much attention to it, it's a good one to kind of put aside and come back to when you have the time to. Um, the book I would probably recommend for people to read first is honestly probably The Deep. Um, it's really good. It's also a pretty short read. 
Um, so it's not a huge time commitment for you. Um, honestly, if you get a chance to, I say, listen to the audio book, um, for any Hamilton fans out there, David Diggs, uh, is one of the members of Clipping and he is the one who narrates the book and it is very good. So I think, um, yeah, just a really good, um, you know, exploration of memory and trauma, but also not a particularly long read. I think the, I think the audio book's only about four hours long. So, uh, that would be my pick for what to start with. Yeah, I've read The Deep. Um, yeah, it's not very long and it has sort of the feeling of like like a fable almost, you know? Yeah. So so yeah, uh, and I, I imagine the audiobook is really good. <laughs> so yes. um I think for me, hmm, maybe a tie between calculating stars and transcendent kingdom just depends on like what you're in the mood for. If you want something really fun, I mean you can't get more, I don't know. The idea of lady astronauts, <laughs> like uh, this is the first in a series. So, uh, and there's also a, a, like a short story or two that goes along with the lady astronauts. Um, so that's, it's kind of a fun and interesting um, take on alternate history. Um, and then Transcendent Kingdom, I just, uh, Yag Yassi is a really great um author. Uh, you may have read Home, Home Going, which was like her first, her first novel. Um, I think Transcendent Kingdom, like I said, um, got, I mean, it, it got a lot of press, but I think with everything that was going on in the world in 2020, it got a bit passed over more than I think it would have if it had even come out in 2021. So um, so definitely try that one if you haven't read it yet. You do have questions in the chat now, Sarah. The first right. one says, can you send the link to the quiz for which books you should read in the chat? But I'll move past that. Which um, books do you think would be best for a book discussion group? Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, I'm not sure about quiz, but we, there is a handout. Um, and if you didn't get that handout before the the presentation, don't worry. I always send a follow-up email um, when the recording is available on YouTube. So if that's what you're referring to, the handout, it will be attached to um, to, the, to that email. So, so no worries there. The second question, though, is asking which groups are, which books are suitable for book discussion groups? Mm -hmm of the ones you presented? I mean, I have several for mine. I really think um, the the two sort of historical fiction, 10th Muse and In the Field would be good discussion picks and um, as well as Transcendent Kingdom would, would definitely be. In fact, we have Transcendent Kingdom as a book discussion kit. So um, that would be a good one. Okay. I'm not familiar with this next question about women's scavenger hunts. I would think they would go to our the library's events page to read about that. Yeah, do either of you have one of these going on at your branch, Alex or Robin? Um, not at the top of my head. Okay. Sorry, Robin, go ahead. No, please. I was gonna say, I think we do in the kids department, but I'm not too familiar with that one either. I believe it's a passive program. So you'll go in and ask at the desk and there's like, places to find things within the library about women's history. Um, yeah, so just ask at the desk because I think it's one of those kinds of passive programs where it's up all month and there's like things to find in the library. Another question that a viewer asked is, is there an author that you would read again that you read for this to prepare for this program? Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Sure, is there an author that you would read again uh, you read it, this books for the program, but is there someone that you're going to follow now? Um, I probably am going to look into reading some more N.K. Jemisin. Um, I have a couple uh, co-workers here who run a sci-fi, who run our sci-fi book club, and they both really love her writing. Um, and I really enjoyed the short stories that I read. Um, so, and I know she's got some very good series that are finished out. So I think I'm going to explore her work a little more, especially because I, I do genuinely enjoy like science fiction. Well, and if I can go next, because I didn't have any for mine, but I love um, The City We Became from N.K. Jemison. So I was excited to see that as one of your picks. And that's now on my list after this as well. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have to say N.K. Jemison is amazing. Um, she's one of the best science fiction writers out right now. And yeah, just to clarify for, for viewers, in um, uh, How Long Till Black Future Month, there's a story uh, called The City, I think that one's called The City We Became, right? 
anyway, well, the but, first one in that series is called "The City We Became." Yeah, I don't know about the short story. There's a story in the book that um, that inspired the rest of the series for the city. Oh, we it's became. where it came from. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh that 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 um that story in that book, and I believe this recently got picked up to maybe become a TV series. I so it's familiar. Yeah. So um so yeah, it's really it's a really interesting story about um New York. There are these sort of like avatars, like like um sort of spiritual beings that are are embodied that like represent the different boroughs of the city and there's like a um sort of an evil force that is threatening the city and these avatars have to like work together uh to to save the city so um it's cool and I um, think there's only two out in that too so yeah. there's the world we make as well so it's short okay, yeah <laughs> And then just one other one, um, because I was very torn between which River Solomon book to use. Um, I also, uh, I really enjoyed The Deep. And uh, the other book that I was torn between that, um, between using was An Unkindness of Ghosts. And I am very interested in reading that now as well. Yeah, if uh, if you watching watched our Black History Month program like a week and a half ago, uh, one of our presenters talked about An Unkindness of Ghosts. So. Uh, it's you can watch that it's already up on youtube if you want to find out more about that that book you can watch that program from last week okay now the books that you discussed they varied and i'm wondering um based on what you've read and your own experiences are we seeing progress or continued struggles for women in the workplace I mean, there is actually, I mean, there's definitely progress, you know, like, I mean, especially if you look at like, um, like the overt discrimination or the overt barriers that were there, um, that we, we've clearly had some progress, I, I think, but, um, but many things are still there that are like, um, like unspoken rules, like un, uh, unspoken things that like different professions have to follow. And, and this is just my opinion, but I think um, in many ways, the pandemic and um, the labor that many women had to like take on and of childcare during the pandemic kind of set, set it back a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but that's just me, me on my, on my horse. But I think like, I, yeah, I mean, we've obviously made some progress, but I think uh, these books sort of highlight like how much there there is still to go especially for women around the world you know so yeah I would just add to that um I think like you say there has been progress though everything with 2020 and uh women being the majority of the people who ended up leaving the workforce as a result of it did set things back um the only other thing I would add to that is um it's also really important to look at um different groups, like um, things are probably going a little bit better for like white women in the workplace than they are for women of color. That's definitely, um, I mean, given two of the books that we discussed tonight, um, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty obvious. So that would be the only other thing I would add. Hmm. There is a new book out. I don't have the title in front of me. It's about uh, women scientists at MIT and the blatant discrimination that they faced, where one scientist, one female scientist said something at a meeting and was put down, and then a man said the same thing 10 minutes later, and they said, oh, that was a great idea, which reminded me of the two books that Sarah talked about. Uh, the Katherine Johnson book, is a, which I read, is an upbeat account of her time at NASA, but then you read the book Disordered Cosmos, it's depressing. Yeah. I mean, I do think, um, like, when you look at those two compared to each other, I mean, some of it is like, um, and Johnson does talk about this a little bit herself, that, like, she does sort of um, benefit from certain kinds of privilege. Like, uh, she's very well educated. She had a family that valued education, and she got pretty much the best education that an African-American woman could have at the time. Um, and uh, also, she was uh, light-skinned, and so she um, 
benefited from sort of colorism. In fact, she talks about, well, remember we, uh, I said she sets the record straight on a couple of scenes from the movie. She talks a little bit about the bathroom scene. I don't know if you've, if, if any of you have seen Hidden Figures, there's a scene in which um, her character has to run across the, um, the NASA campus to use uh, one of the colored bathrooms. And she said, in real life, um, there it is true, the bathrooms were segregated, uh, but she personally didn't have a problem with that, although she knows several colleagues that did have to do this, because she basically just used the bathroom that was closest to her. Uh, it was a, a white women's bathroom, although she didn't realize it at first, because only the colored bathrooms were like labeled. So at first, she didn't realize that uh, this was like not a bathroom she was supposed to use. And then she just like once she did, she's like used it anyway. But she said like because she felt like a certain amount of conviction and because she was sort of um um like ethnically ambiguous, uh it she kind of got a got away with it in a way that perhaps other colleagues would not have been able to. So yeah. So like when you see these sort of like plus I think too like the hindsight of being 99 years old when you and having gone to the Oscars and having all the success, like you can kind of look back on your life and see like, well, this was not great. This was great. Like, but overall my life was positive. Whereas like when um, I think with um, the disorders cosmos, you know, uh, Chandra Prescott Weinstein is like still in the thick of her career and like still fighting the battles, if that makes sense, you know, whereas um, Catherine Johnson had like fought all her battles <laughs> when she read, her, you know, when she wrote her book. So um yeah that's true i don't see any other questions um all right well thank you yeah i, I think uh we, we covered a lot of things i want to thank all of you for sticking around for the q a um thanks so much to robin and alex for presenting and for harry for being our chat monitor and our, our q a moderator um, happy International Women's Day, and uh, we hope that you will join us at another um, virtual program soon. Everyone have a great night. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>